Right. Colleagues, um, welcome. Uh, Mr Hislop, um, I should declare, obviously, that I have sat next to you at a dinner previously, so I have met you before. Right. Um, but I, I don't have think no memory getting... of it. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, I can't comment until Sue Gray reports. <laughs> <laughs> that may not be until the police investigation is over or not. Who knows? Um, and uh, um, would you just want to briefly introduce... What? We're on. We're on. Yes. Sorry, Clark. Um, and would you just like briefly to introduce your two colleagues? Yes, um, these are two of my journalists. This is Richard Brooks um, and this is Solomon Hughes. They both write um, for the section of the magazine about conflict of interest. Uh, Richard Brooks appeared with me before one of your members to talk about ACOBA and the failure to police sufficiently um, uh, members of parliament and ex-ministers when they go on to jobs. But we're here today to talk about failure to police politicians when they're actually in the job. That is my understanding. So just as a start of a 10, how do you think we're doing on standards in British public life at the moment? Um, it's not good, is it? Um, I would say that obviously it's good that we're here at all after the Prime Minister's cack-handed attempt to actually demolish the whole system. But since we are here, um, post Owen Paterson, I think we have to admit that the system failed um, in that Owen Paterson had obviously no idea he was breaking the code and a large number of his fellow MPs decided that they had no idea either and that the whole system wasn't working. And I think we do, and my colleagues will come in very quickly here, we have to redefine the term lobbying and we have to incorporate some of the proposals that you've made except make them harsher. Just ask you about... Um one of the things that's sort of around in the ether is about um, people who had perhaps legitimate conversations with companies when they were in ministerial office, but then when they left ministerial office, then joined the company employed for them. Have you got evidence of that? Do you think that that's a, a key issue that we're not addressing properly? Well, I mean, we've given evidence before um, about exactly this and presented evidence about um, people who've had jobs in specific areas and then gone on um, to work with companies um, who benefit from government contracts. I mean, there's absolutely loads of it. Um, and I will say the same thing is, what, what do you think these companies are paying the money for? You think they're chucking it away? I mean, and, and when politicians declare their interests, I mean, what, why do they think these businesses are paying them this money? Why did Owen Paterson think he was being given all this money? What, because he's so brilliant? I mean, it, again, I think the public is, is it's very sick of being taken for fools at the moment on all sorts of level, and it's very sick of being taken for fools on this level. If you're taking money from a company, what are they getting out of it? Which is why the earlier answers from both of my colleagues was, at least print the contract tell us what you're being employed for, and let's have a look at the minutes of the board meeting. What did you say in this specific area? Say you're employed, as Solomon always says, to sell guns or uh, bombs or weapons, um, and then uh, you have a board meeting. If you won't tell us what you said in the meeting, don't take the job. Okay. Not too extreme, Richard? No, maybe not extreme enough. Uh, thank you very much for the evidence you gave to the, my committee, the Public Administration and Constitution Affairs Committee back in 2017, because I think we produced one of the best reports we ever produced. And, yes, but we're on this committee now. And, <laughs> and it took a very long time for the government to respond to it. Um, but um, uh, just to pick up one thing you said, um, why do you think so many MPs did not see that Mr Patterson was in breach of the code? Why, why do you, because I think it was a bit more complicated than that. No, I don't think it was at all. Um, and I'm sure your chairman has views on this. I mean, the, the investigation was incredibly thorough. Um, <laughs> he was given every opportunity to respond. It was absolutely clear he'd broken all the rules. The public were quite clear um, that he'd taken the money and he'd lobbied. So, and the MPs were whipped into this ridiculous bill. OK, but why do you think so many MPs didn't think he had broken the rules? Well, I'm, do, you, do you want me to go into why they obey the party whip? No, no, no. I'm, I mean, I'm, you're MPs. You I'm, could I'm explain to us. I'm independent enough. I, never, I hardly ever obey the party whip. I vote with my brain. But um, the, um, uh, for some reason, our system lacks authority over 
a large number of MPs. They don't respect the system. Why do you think that is? Well, I begin. Let's break down the MPs who have second jobs. One of yeah. you two. Well, I, I mean, to, to answer your question, I think that the, the rules give them such leeway. The rules and the implementation of them give them such leeway. Owen Paterson could spend years thinking that he wasn't doing anything wrong, uh, partly because the rules were too vague on lobbying, and secondly, because he could convince himself that uh, what he was doing wasn't problematic, that the company he was working for was a jolly good company, uh, and that, uh, you know, what's not to like and so on. Um, and eventually, it, you know, we found out exactly what he was doing. The issue is, I think, that we don't find out what a lot of other MPs are doing. Okay, well, and we'll move, I'm sure we'll move on to questions about transparency I, I want to keep this and so quite, on, quite, but quite, that's the issue. I, 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 I mean, we have lots of rules. Mr. Patterson was in breach of the rules. Um, um, and let's just take his case. Unfortunately, he didn't understand he was in breach of the rules. Wouldn't that be a more of a sort of cultural and attitude and attitude problem rather than that rules can't on themselves in their, on their own fix? What do we need in addition to rules? Well, because we need the rules to, me... to be tougher and you need to police them more toughly. Okay, but you can... That's not a very good in, adverb, in, more um, stringently. Well, uh, you can police rules tougher and you have tougher rules... But, they, but lots of people will carry on gaming rules. If they think the rules are the only issue and they don't understand why the rules exist, what the principles are behind the rules, you're not going to change people's attitudes. Well, that, that's it's just depressing, the idea that yeah. politicians are so innately corrupt that uh, they won't understand public well, anger at what in, they're doing and in, none of them will obey the rules. Well, it happens in public service, it happens in, 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 in financial Yeah, we're talking services. about MPs here. It, it happens in journalism, it happens in lots of professions. Yeah, but fortunately yeah. this <laughs> committee is not looking into us. We're no, having a look okay, at you. Yeah, okay, it's not an attack on you. I'm just p pointing out there are lots of... Um, uh, that actually to change, um, to improve the attitude towards uh, the prin seven principles in top public life, we, re we require far more than rules. Wouldn't you agree with that? Far more well, you want a moral rules. shift in the quality of people who become MPs. I well, can't do much about that. Well, how about having more conversation um, in the workplace about why we have rules, what the principles mean, and how we should be setting the best example? God, why do you have <laughs> to explain to a new MP why he shouldn't lobby for a company that's taking government contracts? The same why reason, isn't that blatantly obvious? The same reason that you have to sit uh, people in the financial services sector down to courses and exams, what the, why the solicitors, reg, uh, solicitors Regulation Authority encourages firms of solicitors to have discussions about ethics. It's because it's a fundamental fact of human nature that we are born savages and we have to be trained to be civilised human beings. Right. Can, can we leave the ethics and go on to the practicalities oh, of right, what you can see. do? So isn't that, I thought this was all about ethics. I thought that we wanted to make this... No, I, th I thought you wanted a philosophical discussion about the fallen human condition, yeah. which, again, no, you no, say no. you've got a vote right. okay. in right. an hour. Right. I think I will drop this line of inquiry, Chair, because I'm not getting very far with it. But, but if you look at the numbers, but, which yeah. these guys frequently yeah, exactly. do, the number of people who, who are in trouble over the conflict of interest is a, is a very small minority of MPs. Um, it, a lot of them are the same MPs, um, a lot of them are uh, usually from the party that's in power at the time, which gives you a clue to what the businesses are spending their money on, and they don't involve the headline figures of, oh, she's a nurse, she's a doctor, that's ridiculous. Of course it's ridiculous, that's not what the problem is. The problem is this top layer of people who get jobs which are not related to their skills. They're saying, would you like to work for, uh, you know, a nutrition company? Would you like to work for a laboratory? Are you a scientist? No. What are you? I'm an MP who's willing to take the money. Well, that's a skill. Um, it's just not good enough. Um, Paul, I'd like to move away from lobbying, uh, if that's OK with, with you. Mr Hislop, you, you were quite complimentary about the way the Owen Paterson affair was investigated. I was. Yeah, the, 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 the Commissioner did a great job. We reviewed it appropriately. And we produced a, a report. Um, in terms of regulating... The, uh, the MPs. What, what is your assessment of the House's standard system for spake, you know, good and bad? Uh, and what do you think the public's perception of it is? And how would you, what would you do to improve it? All right, the public perception is that, was this the tip of the iceberg that we were lucky to be told about? If Owen Paterson was happily doing this, what else did we miss? I think that's what a lot of people thought. Um, I mean, it, it was a very particular case 
um, in which it, it blew up and, and the public found out about it. But again, I think, um, Solomon, your point is that at elections and, yeah. and generally, people don't know what these yeah. conflicts are. I was going to say, because the, 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 the theory, the sort of transparency theory, is that uh, uh, MPs have a second job and that brings extra experience and that informs their work as an MP and uh, it's properly registered and it's put to the electorate and they may decide, but that's not actually what happens. If you look at it, very often MPs take second jobs after they've been elected, so it's not put to the voters. I mean, I looked at some of the more... Um, uh, eye-catching ones that are caught in the, uh, the newspapers and so uh, Chris Grayling took his 100,000k job with uh, uh, a former transport secretary took it with a port operator Hutchinson but he took it after the election uh, uh, former deputy prime minister Damien Green took his 40k consultancy to private rail operator Abellio after the election forgive me, I, I, you're doing what a lot of MPs do and not answer the question. Uh, the question was, what do you think of the House of Commons Standards Committee? How would you improve it? And well, I mean, he's the, saying the point, sort of... The point the is that the public, was, I, the public the perception is very important, that there is a House, there is a Standards Committee, that, that they, and there is a standards process whereby if MPs do, you know, contravene the rules, there is a, there is a, a regulatory body and a regulatory process. I think what Solomon is saying is one of the things you could do is say to people, um, you need to tell the electorate... Um, when you're campaigning, you say, the reason you should vote for me is because I work for a hedge fund. And not all the time, obviously, and I won't, I won't devote too much time, but I'm, I'm pretty matey with a lot of hedge funders, so vote for me. And then two months later, if you take a job with the hedge funds and you haven't declared it, your committee should say, time to put that on the record. Next time you stand up in the House, you say, before I say anything else, I should say, I've taken a job with the hedge funders, and um, obviously it won't influence anything I say about tax wealth that's creation that's what's supposed to happen now. or policies. Uh, good afternoon gentlemen and thank you for appearing before us. I'm very much enjoying the robustness of the answers that you're giving, uh, giving to questions. I'm often accused of being perhaps a bit too robust on this committee with the questions that I ask but and I will continue to be robust in the questions and I hope you continue to be robust in your answers. I suspect that you're being robust in particular Mr Hislop because, like me, you have a real, passionate, deep love for our democratic institutions. Am I right? A, a deep love of what, sorry? Of our democratic institutions. Yes, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm quite keen on democracy. Yes. Um, which is why I found it so depressing earlier to imagine that none of our representatives were capable of marking their own homework. I mean, well, do you probably remember at school, teachers sometimes gave out the test you'd just done and you passed it one to the right. I so did, another did, fellow pupil never, was marking your homework. Never did, but the point is, the point I'm making, from the television programmes that you've done, um, it, I've always felt that you've come across as somebody that actually cares very deeply, even though you come across with a lot of humour, a lot of satire, but you come across as somebody that genuinely cares about Britain. Am I right? I'm, I'm not sure flattery is allowed on yeah. this committee. No, no, uh, allow me to build up the, the line of questioning, but am I, am I right? Yes, yes, I'm... Do you yes, have so a I'm, deep I'm, love of Britain, yes or no? yes. Thank you. It says, uh, the questions I'm going to ask you are to do with process. Yes. And I'm going to ask you to detach for a moment the emotion. Because I'm very keen, and I'm a stickler as a lawyer for process. And I've been uncomfortable as a member of this committee on some of the processes that we adopt, regardless of the substance of the cases that we have to, that we have to deal with. I've just looked at your Wikipedia site, never, never a site to go to for any facts, but it says here that Mr Hislop is reputedly the most sued man in English legal history. Your lawyers must be in, uh, very happy at that, at that thought. But the point that I may, I'm going to make is this. Imagine the scenario where a claimant makes an allegation against you and takes the matter to court. And the claimant presents the case against you and you present your defence. And then the judge goes into chambers and invites the claimant in whilst the judge is deliberating against the, uh, in respect of, of the claim made against you. What would you say to that? I'd say, where is this analogy going? <laughs> what, what would you say in such an analogy? What would you say to that? Would you, would you suggest that that is... Where, where are you going Well, I'm this? asking you a question of natural justice. Would you say that that is... Is this the Owen Patterson case? Are you no, saying no, the I'm, process I'm not, was I'm abused? Not talk, I'm not going to talk about the substance of cases. I'm asking about process, and I've got serious questions about process from which 
I would greatly appreciate serious responses for a moment. Alberta, I think you need okay. to be a bit more direct so, in your question rather than This analysis. is a serious response. Okay, so at the moment, the House of Commons, through its standing orders, created this committee of 14. And one of our roles on this committee is as a disciplinary body. It's a committee of 14 people. We also, through standing orders, created the Office of the Parliamentary Commissioner, currently held by uh, the excellent Catherine Stone. The issue I've had with my colleagues is not about individuals, not about cases, but about process. And it's this, that presently the person that investigates claims against MPs is the Commissioner. That's her first role. The second role that the Commissioner has is to adjudicate as a first instance decision maker. She will decide whether or not an MP has breached the code. If the matter is deemed serious enough, she will have a third role, and that is to present the case before this committee against the MP. And at that point, the MP is invited also to give a submission, and he or she might want to do that. But after the submissions have been made, the Commissioner comes back into the committee during our deliberations. That's the fourth role, as an advisor to the committee. And I have felt through my two years on this committee, regardless of the substance of the cases, regardless of the personalities involved, I felt as a matter of process that that is wrong, that that does not comply with natural justice. What would your view be on that? Um, I, d I don't really have a, a view on that. I mean, if, if, if you think the processes are unjust, you should sort that bit out. I mean, really, I think we, we came here to give evidence on mm. what you can do to improve the regulatory part of it, the access for journalists, um, and um, the basic um, adherence to the morality of it. I'm sorry, I was not prepared for a question on that sort of process. Um, and again, if we're short of time, I don't really, I don't really have it. Sorry, either of my colleagues. No, but I do think that you know the evidence of the Owen oh, Patterson case was that a committee of MPs can do a good job. I think it's important that parliamentarians do resolve these problems. Uh, yeah. Do the transparency provisions work? Uh, I, I think we understand that they're not, they're not, you know, that the technology doesn't enable uh, transparency. We are pressing the House authorities to make some investment in improving things. Um, I feel like I'm 32, 30 years too old to know what act actually would be the best uh, approach to this. Uh, the, you know, Ethan earlier probably has better, you know, better ideas that would never occur to me. But are, are there things that y you would like to see, either in terms of the technology or the content? I think the technology may be solvable. Um, <laughs> the transparency bit requires people to say who this company is and what the company does. Um, and just saying um, a, a name of a company, no reference to it in Companies House. Henry made the point. Yeah. Um, you would like to see more. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, sometimes you look at an entry and you don't, you're really none the wiser. Um, you know, you might not be surprised that private eye journalists coming to a meeting like this checked out the interests of the members of this committee. <laughs> oh, really? Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, Mr. Jenkins has a, just recorded an entry of £1,500 shooting trip from a Richard Matthews. And you look at Richard Matthews, no idea who he is. Google Richard Matthews shooting, you find some murder in America. Well, that's not too informative. We assume it wasn't him. <laughs> um, you know, those kind of... So, so we're none the wiser sometimes, often with companies. The company number isn't given. I mean, there's a whole series. I mean, Henry and Esther covered it pretty well. But um, there's a lot where the detail... I think, you, I think it would be useful to set up a sort of procedural, I don't know, review or committee or whatever... Um, and, and on all, all kinds of, you know, the purpose and the nature of not just jobs, but hospitality, gifts, needs to be explained a bit more. What was the purpose? You know, Mr. Costas just questioned us. His register of interest shows that Heineken paid for very expensive seats to the World Cup semi-final over the summer. Why? Them. What did Heineken want from that? Why would they do that? Was Mr. Heineken a brewer in a previous life? Does he know expertise on that? No, but we need to know. He was what a lawyer. Was. Why right. was he? Why, you know. So, so on his on, for example, Mr. Costa on that entry needs to say, I think, needs to say precisely what what the, the gift or hospitality was. So therefore, what the interest was, why he accepted it. A brief reason for how it performed a parliamentary duty would be very useful. I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't think my affairs are really 
the concern of the committee, but I'm very happy to answer any questions about that. Yeah. But it's there on the record. And yeah, but it's, not, it's, but it's very difficult. Well, it is on the record, but it only says a person's name. It doesn't yes, say anybody, where they're from. Any journalist, anybody, any, any constituent can ring me up and say, what's all this about? And they could, questions. yeah. That's an, yet another step. They should be able to just look at it. But it would, it would and help see your processes if you put a little bit more detail, and then no one would have to be suspicious. Well, we have a common interest in sailing, and he's a constituent, and as a matter of policy, I always declare gifts of that kind from constituents. Yeah. That's right. Story. So are, it's that's... a gift from a constituent. Yeah. yeah. What, what's right. his business? Is right, that right, important? Right. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Right. Um, I'm not going to engage in, in that any further, not least because I don't know what you're going to say to me. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I'm, coming, I'm coming to you just a moment, Alberto. Um, what, the, the, you would expect these journalists to have done that and to yes. say these are, are good examples of yeah. just not enough information we don't know. And historically, I mean, both of the, the work that Solomon and Richard do, you look, you look at the companies who are spending the most money, and they're not the good guys. Uh, the people yeah. who really are shelling out money um, to MPs come from very specific lobbies. You know, we're in a very old building. It, it was the sugar lobby, sugar lobby a long time ago, you know, and then it was the tobacco lobby. And, you know, the gambling lobby is pretty strong now, and there are plenty of others, and the, the lobbies from the financial world. Again, I don't think any of this is hugely complex. It is pretty much who you think it will be, and they're doing what you think they're doing. Alberto. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think the evidence you're giving is quite persuasive, actually, and I'm, I'm very grateful I see again for a second time that you, you're appearing before us. Uh, as Bernard correctly said, we're not here to discuss individual cases, but you referred to an entry in my register, and I'm going to seek your advice. Because this was, this was the situation I, fa I was faced. I never accept hospitality, and I didn't. What I faced was, the night before the event, a member of my staff phoning me up, who had been working extraordinarily hard over the COVID period, saying to me, Alberto, you know I'm a football fan. You've received an email, and it's inviting you to this event. I'm not a football fan. Alberto, can I go? What should my response have been to that hard-working member of staff, in your opinion? I would say no. you would refer him to the <laughs> Prime Minister's excuse that all his staff are incredibly hard-working and therefore deserve a drink at the end of the day. There's lots of people are hard-working. You might have thought, oh, this free ticket should go to the nurse in the ICU ticket. I mean, uh, ICU department. Okay, I'm, I'm being frivolous, but I'm just saying okay. it's not a very good excuse. Okay. Well, it's not an excuse, it's the fact. I'm just yeah, no, no, but you're using yes. the fact as well, an I'm, excuse, I'm, and I'm, I'm saying okay. I don't think it's totally convincing. Right. So on the second point about the disclosure of it, my member of staff was at pains to point out to the registrar exactly what had happened. And we were at pains, he was at pains to say it was a member of staff. I noticed, Richard Brooks, in, in your referral to it, you didn't mention that point. You didn't say it was for a member of your staff. You said it was for me, which I thought was odd. And I'm wondering okay. whether you've got evidence oh. to give to us about how we disclose these things. Should it be a very long narrative? Or should it just be a very short narrative? What is it you're suggesting? A brief reason for why you accepted it. I mean, that Heineken have done you a favour mm -hmm. by providing a treat to your staff. I mean, it's all very well saying it was just it was a member of my staff, not me. But you're the member of Parliament. Yes. You asked the you 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 said to your member of staff here, you take the ticket. Um, so they've done you a, you've you know so you've given your member of staff a benefit. Therefore, Heineken has given you a benefit. They've done you a favour, a very valuable favour. I can't. You know, millions of people would have wanted to go to see Italy v Spain in the World Cup semi-final. I'd love to have gone. They couldn't. So you've just been given a big favour by someone with a lot of money. Okay. That sort of thing shouldn't really happen. I would want to correct from the beginning is, um, I think we feel as if in the end the system on the Owen Patterson case triumphed. And it, um, but it was only by <laughs> dint of quite a lot of hard work. Um, yes. And not but just not shouldn't it be good though. enough, should it? No, indeed. But anyway, um, thank you very much for your time, and um, we look forward to reading about it. <laughs> 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 thank you very much. I'm briefly